Amen. Well, thank you so much, church. If you are just joining us online, I want to say welcome. Welcome to church. Again, my name is Adam Ziegenhagel. Uh, I am the lead pastor here at Encounter Church. I am so excited for this morning because it is Easter Sunday. Come on, Easter Sunday. What a great day. And weather to match. I'm just so excited. I hope that it doesn't like cloud over and we walk out of here this morning and it's like raining or something. That would not be great. But it is just an amazing morning to be together. It, it, this is like, I say it every time and I can't help it, but it's, it is like the Super Bowl Sunday of faith right now. This is just awesome. So it's so exciting. And I want to just jump right in this morning. I'm pausing the series that we are in right now to just talk about Easter. And so I want to do something this morning as we jump into it. I want to just pray and just position our hearts to God and really go after what he has for us this morning, what I feel that he has for us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. And we just posture ourselves in a place right now, in a position to receive from you. So we lay aside any distractions that may be in our homes right now. Uh, Maybe if it's uh, animals, if it's stress of bills that need to be paid or things going on in our lives, we just lay that aside so that we can focus on you. God, this message, the gospel message, the, the entirety and theme of the Bible, God, we pray that it would do something fresh in us this morning that would encourage us and see something happen through us as we leave uh, this morning, whether we leave our homes or we leave the time together, God. We just give you ourselves. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, what I want to do this morning is I want to quickly talk through uh, for us the purpose of Easter, but also its lasting effects, right? Because Easter is really the fulfillment of a promise. It's the fulfillment of a promise, which we, you know, even sang about earlier, which I just, I love. Um, But we now have the opportunity to place our trust in Jesus, knowing that he will follow through with what he has said he will do. So listen, you you know, I grew up in the church. I grew up going to church multiple times a week because that's just what you did back then. You know, I I remember going like for uh, like three times on a Sunday and like twice throughout the week. Like that's just what we did, right? I still remember like the basic Easter message in Sunday school. I still remember the flannel graph being pulled out and images of the tomb rolling away, you know, the the stone that wouldn't roll because it was stuck to the flannel graph. I, I remember all of those things. But the reality for me is that Easter and its significance didn't really become real to me until much later in my life. So I want to paint a picture of the promise for us this morning that we have and got to see happen and fulfilled uh, some 2,000 years ago. So for those of you that are joining that may be new to faith or even exploring faith, which is awesome, I want to express the heart of God for you this morning. For those that we would call maybe savvy veterans of faith this morning, uh, I want to encourage you and talk about what you can do now uh, that you have received what we know as the gospel. So for this, I want to start back way at the beginning. And I want to start back when the problem of sin entered the world. And this chapter is one that I keep coming back to uh, when we talk about the gospel. And really, to me, I see it as the origin story, right? If you're, if you're a movie buff or like, especially like uh, Marvel and like all those types of things, there's always like an origin story for people and for things. Well, Our story, the gospel story, has an origin story as well. And so before I get to really the meat of what I want to highlight for us this morning, I just, I have to give you some background in case you missed last Easter's message, because that's really where I'm coming off of uh, for this year. Genesis chapter three is the account of sin entering the world. Uh, If you have a Bible and you open it up to Genesis chapter three, you might see even at the top right above uh, the big three, it might have a title that says the fall of man. Because this is when sin entered the world. See, this chapter speaks of Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. You know, the images that are now coming to our minds, uh, thinking about that. How the enemy lied and persuaded them, uh, the two of them, to to sin. That's what's found in in Genesis chapter 3 at the beginning. And then all of a sudden, it comes. With, uh, God comes along, walking through the garden. And Adam and Eve, knowing that they had sinned, they, they recognized now their nakedness and they hid from God. 
And that's important. I'm going to talk about that later. But God finds them and asks them why they were hiding, and they tell him basically what they've done. They come clean, right? And before we go any further, I want to point out one foundational, that we, one foundational thing that we have already seen now in this chapter. I know that we didn't actually look at it just for the sake of time, but in this, in this beginning portion of chapter 3, we can see something. We, we see that it was God's original design. God designed for us to be in relationship with him. We see that in how God would walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. They had this personal, this close, intimate relationship with God. It wasn't even uh, through prayer or anything. They would be able to talk to him face to face. That was God's original design. And I love that. It is so important for us to realize this because in our world, there is this perception that because God is our creator, which he is, then he must have created or cause the bad things that we all face as well. One of the most common questions that I have faced as a pastor, and even before I be, uh, began pastoral ministry, just a person of faith, one of the most common questions that I got was why does God let bad things happen? As if God created those things. And I hear still all the time people of faith saying like, well, God you know, caused this to happen in my life to teach me a lesson, to grow me, to shape me, to mold me. And they, they speak of God creating and designing negative things in our lives as a, a tool or as a thing just about who he is to punish or to whatever. And it's just like a common misconception. Here we see original design. It was perfect. It was flawless. God and man in perfect relationship. That's the way that he intended it right from the beginning. So it doesn't matter if you're here this morning as someone exploring faith or if you've been a Christian for a long time, you need to know that the world that we live in has been tarnished by sin. God's creation, as beautiful as it still is, has been affected by sin. And we have to understand that. When God found out what the serpent did as Adam and Eve explained to him what happened. This was his response in verse 14. And I want to look at that. Genesis chapter three, verse 14 says this, the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field on your belly, you shall go and dust. You shall eat all the days of your life. Um, <clears throat> I, this is missing some words, I think. Uh, I will put envy between you and, and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And I wanna talk about that this morning. I should have read from up there. It has everything there. That's perfect. Awesome. I wanna look at this. See, some theologians consider this verse, actually verse 15, as their proto-evangelium. And I don't have a clue if I pronounced that right, but it looks like I pronounced it right. Which means the first good news, which means the first gospel. This is the first time in scripture that we can just even catch a glimpse of God's heart for humanity in redemption. The offspring of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. This is where Paul, you know, picks up this imagery in Romans chapter 16, verse 20. And he says this, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. You know, I, love, I remember even in youth groups singing songs about that, which I will not do. I was about to. We, I will not do that right now. But uh, there was a song about crushing Satan. And I remember like, I remember in Sunday school, like jumping on his head and stuff like that. But you know, so this is, but right from the beginning, we start to see this imagery. The moment that sin enters the world, God's heart, the position of his heart for mankind was to redeem them all, to redeem them all. I love this. And this chapter, and in this chapter in Genesis, we also see a foreshadow of what to, what's to take place thousands of years later. 
to what we remember and celebrate this weekend through the work of the cross. This Easter, Genesis chapter 3, 21, it says, And the Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skin and clothed them. And listen, skins came from obviously an animal. They, skins, that's what skin is. Uh, a sacrifice of life had to be made to cover their nakedness, to cover their sin. So even in this, in this chapter, the origin story of, of sin, we see the perfect picture of the gospel message. It all begins with God. He creates man, is with man in perfect relationship. Man in free will chose to sin. The problem of all of that is it created separation between God and man, which you see in, in, a, in a, a later chapter. But after that, we know the solution that Jesus is sent to be a sacrifice. So in that, you see like the entirety of the gospel message in this one chapter. And that to me is just exciting that from the very beginning, uh, in we see the, this image of God already saying, I will redeem mankind. Throughout the Old Testament, we see Hebrew people uh, uh, making sacrifices to atone for their sin. And we know now Jesus was the ultimate sacrifice that paid the price for all sin, past, present, and future. All we need to do is go to him and receive this incredible free gift. And I love how in this picture in Genesis 3, we even see that this display of covering their nakedness was given to them before they even recognized their sin. See, I don't know if you've ever read Genesis chapter 3 and you go through that account of Adam and Eve sinning and coming towards God. Both of them deflected and blamed their sin on the serpent. Neither of them admitted or accepted what they had done. How many of you know that when it comes to sin, sometimes we have the ability to deflect, to not take uh, ownership of the things that we have done in our life? And to me, this is the perfect picture of what we see in the gospel message, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus went to the cross, paid the ultimate price which we all owed, before we ever accepted him as savior, before we ever got our act together and acted a certain way. See, this is the message of the cross and the victory that we live in because of the empty tomb. He is risen. Easter Sunday. This is the heart of the father towards you. And a verse that is so perfect in summarizing this and that, you know, has been made extremely popular in church circles and beyond is John chapter 3, verse 16. That says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. But verse 17 is so important too. That says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Sometimes our world around us and, and really in Christian circles as well have this tendency to see God as this, this, this mean God from heaven pointing a finger of judgment. And really sin is, is what he judges. He looks at that and, and he despises sin because of what, it, of what it does to us. And so he gave a way for us to be without sin, to be set free. Jesus came to save. He came to pay the price of sin that we owed, not because we were worthy of it, but because of God's great love for each and every single one of us. The promise of a savior throughout scripture was fulfilled at the cross and at the empty tomb. The cross and the empty tomb are this incredible picture that we have of a promise fulfilled. So for those of us that are joining this morning, that we would call savvy veterans of faith, okay? So you've already accepted him. I encourage you with this. I encourage you to continue to deal with the sin in your life. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, did you ever think about that? 
I know that so many of us think that when we uh, become saved, we walk through a sinner's prayer and we are now saints, you know, we kind of tend to just let the sin that we walk in just fester and lay to the side. Putting on this perfect face and front when we go to church to meet with other people that are probably in the exact situation as we are. We need to deal with the sin in our life. Allow this fulfilled promise that we see, that we celebrate this Easter weekend to continue to set you free, to continue to do the work that it began in you. This isn't a one-time gift. It's not some infomercial that you have to act now and then it'll be all gone. Like it is, it is for you. He is still for you. Keep being forgiven. And then Walk in being sanctified. Allow God to grow you and shape you. Allow Holy Spirit to empower you, to help you stand firm in your faith and stand against any attack of the enemy and stand against any sin that would want to come in and creep in. You actually have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to help you fight those battles and not have to walk down some of the roads that you've walked down. God has proven himself faithful He's proven himself faithful in this. So we have opportunity now to trust him. Trust him to be faithful in other promises that we have from him. How true can this be? Trust in him that he is with you always, that he will never leave you nor forsake you, that when you are going through the thick of it, that you can know that he is right there with you, that he will empower you with his spirit to be able to stand against those attacks. Trust in him. Put your whole trust in him. I'm reminded right now of one of Seth's memory verses that he shared when he gave his testimony in Costa Rica. And I don't remember the reference. I'll have to look it up later. But it it simply says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in him. How incredible is that? That we can put our trust in him when the situation around us doesn't look the way that we think it should. We can put our trust in him. Hey, if you're joining us this morning as a person maybe exploring faith, this message is for you this morning. He has done everything that is required for you to come back into relationship with him. All you have to do is receive him. Recognize that you have sin in your life. You are separated from him. Believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sin and invite him into your life to be your Lord and lead you forever. We do that in a simple prayer, which I'm going to lead you in in just a couple minutes. But listen, we have this preconceived notion because uh, of our culture that we live in that love is conditional. That love needs to be, uh, uh, is earned. Love is uh, given to those who measure up to a certain standard. But God's love isn't like that. God's love is for you. It is for you right now. It's actually for you even if you choose not to accept him. It's for you. God's love is for you. And so right now you may be looking at your own life thinking, you know what, I am so messed up, jacked up, the things I've done. Pastor Adam, you have no idea what I've done. Listen, I was in that same boat and saw myself as disqualified. Somebody who knew from an early age the truth and chose not to accept that chose to walk a different path and do some things that, you know, uh, bring shame and guilt and, you know, all that kind of, all that kind of baggage. And I've been there before. And so our situations may not be exactly the same, but what I can tell you is that he loves you. He loves you right now, right where you're at, in your living room, in your friend's living room, wherever you are right now, he loves you right where you are at. There is not something that you need to get together in order for him to love you. He loves you right where you are right now. We tell people that he loves you 100%. He can't love you any less and he can't love you anymore. He loves you completely right now. So what I want to do this morning is lead you in a simple prayer. If you want to begin a relationship with him, he's waiting. You know, the Bible tells us he's standing at the door knocking, waiting for somebody to open the door and answer. So let him in this morning. I believe that there's a simple phrase that turned my heart towards God and I believe that he's saying this to you right now. Uh, He wants you to come home. He has arms open, ready to receive you. So if you want to begin a relationship with him this morning, I'm going to invite you to just repeat this prayer after me. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. 
I acknowledge that you died on the cross to pay for my sin. I want to invite you into my life to be my Lord, to lead me forever. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Come on, we believe right now that for every one person that would say that prayer, that would put their trust in Jesus, that would invite him into their life, that acknowledges who they are in the absence of him and and receives him, we believe that all of heaven is rejoicing and we would love to rejoice with you. We would love to rejoice with you, to be able to pray with you, to be able to resource you. We've got some things that we would love to give you. We've got a Bible, a journal, and some other things that we want to put into your hands. But we can't do that if we don't know who you are. So if you are joining us and you just said that prayer, there'll be a little, bo- uh, little button that'll pop up on the website right now that says, uh, I, wanna, I wanna begin a relationship with Jesus. I raise my hand, something like that. You just click on that button and fill out the form. We would love to contact you and give you some things and celebrate with you this incredible Easter morning. You know, what I'm thinking about it right now as we say this. It was Easter that I gave my life to Jesus. It was Easter... Uh, how many years ago now? 21? 20 years ago? 21 years ago. 21 years ago, Easter. Uh, that's incredible. So, it, hey, this is awesome. But we would love to get the, those resources into your hand and really help you in this journey with him. For the rest of us here this morning, we are challenged with this one simple truth, that he died for us. But he didn't die for us so that we could just receive him and then sit back and wait. He he died for us so that we can receive him, be brought into a place of relationship with him, be sanctified in him, and then help others encounter him in the same powerful way. So I am believing for an uh, an incredible uh, spurt of growth, if you would say. Uh, for Encounter Church, of people encountering Jesus for the first time. I am believing that he is empowering us as a church, awakening his church to bring the gospel to our friends and our family, our coworkers, to our neighbors, to the, the, to the streets, to wherever he would call us. And I believe that we are going to see some lives radically transformed by his love. Amen? Amen. So let me just pray for us as we draw our time to a close. Father, we thank you. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for Easter, for the work, the finished work of the cross, for the empty tomb, what that says for us, what that does for us, what that does for this broken world, that redemption, reconciliation is found in you. So God, we just pray this Easter Sunday that as we celebrate, we would just have another glimpse of you, your love for us, that we would encounter you fresh again today as we look upon your creation, the beauty of it, as we talk about the greatness of who you are and as we celebrate you. So we just give you the rest of this day, the rest of our weekend together. We pray that you would work in us and work through us. In your mighty name we pray, amen, amen. Family, we love you. Happy Easter. We will see you next week.